Good morning, friends and family of the Northwest Seventh-day Adventist Church in Crown Point, Indiana. As we are facing this pandemic internationally known as COVID-19 or coronavirus, our World Church, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, is inviting every member of our denomination and even friends of our denomination to participate in 100 days of prayer. Our membership worldwide is more than 21 million people. And if everybody signs up for 100 days to prayer, for prayer rather, what mighty things can be done for so many people. When you sign up, you will have an opportunity to receive special materials. In addition to that, you will become, if you would like to, become a part of the online prayer room. Also, there will be a devotional that you can read every day that will strengthen you in your walk with the Lord. Now, how do you sign up? Well, basically, you go to uh, the website that's entitled, or you just put in revivalandreformation.org. Once you have gone to that particular webpage, then you can easily sign up. Every day, there are certain things that our church is asking us to pray for. This 100 days of prayer started actually yesterday, March the 27th, and will conclude on Independence Day, July the 4th. And that, as I said, each and every day there will be certain things that we're being asked to pray for. On yesterday, which was the first day of our 100 days of prayer, these are some of the things that our church has asked us to remember in prayer. Pray for God's church to stand strong in the midst of the great COVID-19 health crisis facing our world. Pray for our many professional health care providers. Pray for the doctors, the nurses, and others working around the clock to save lives. Pray for our church members especially in Italy, France, Spain, Germany, and of course here in the United States as these are the hardest hit regions of the COVID-19 pandemic. They're asking us also to pray for church members and healthcare workers in New York City, one of the hardest hit regions in the United States. We're asked to pray that the corona uh, virus uh, pandemic would not or would stop spreading and that God would hear the cries of his people and heal our world. So those are the, some of the things that we were asked to pray for just on the first day of the 100 days of prayer. And I'm sure that you would like to sign up and become part of this special prayer ministry. Once again, all you have to do is log in or go to the uh, webpage, which is revivalandreformation.org. And if we all pray together, I believe God will do wonderful things for us. Now, having said that, uh, we're ready to go into our message for... You're not on. I didn't think so. What do I do? Put, put the torch on the top of the device. I asked you if I had to do anything. <laughs> so all of that good speech was for nothing. No, no, they saw her here. Our subject this morning is entitled, The Battle for the Mind. Shall we pray? Father God, as we open your word, we invite you to draw near to us and give us the blessings that we stand in need of. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the average person has approximately 48 thoughts a minute. Wow. 
That computes to 70,000 thoughts a day or 25 million thoughts a year. Can you believe that? 25 million thoughts a year. Each of us think about it. Now, the brain is about three pounds of rubbery gray substance lodged in your cranium. Your brain has 100 billion, not million, 100 billion cells. The brain cells are the longest living cells in the human body. You've heard of the expression brain dead. Well, what that means is that your body is not scientifically considered dead until all the brain cells have died out. Now, the thoughts in the brain are powered by neurotransmitters, which in turn are powered by an abundant supply of blood. These neurotransmitters develop pathways in the brain based on our thinking process. So just as water forms a river by repeating the same path, our thoughts create a reality by going down the same frequency in the brain over and over again. That's why the wise man said in the book of Proverbs, as a man thinketh, so is he. Ellen White talked about these electrical impulses in the brain. These impulses fire repeated messages down a pathway in our brains so that the more you think certain thoughts, the deeper the electrical pathway becomes. In other words, when you have repeated thoughts in your brain, the more you think that thought over and over again, the deeper the pathway becomes. Now, here's a vital truth that impacts our thinking. The human brain is so constructed that it will always set itself upon something. There is no such thing as an empty brain. It's a law of life that if you think about something often enough, if you think about something long enough, you'll come to the place where you cannot stop thinking about that particular thing. Let me, let me repeat that again. If you think about something long enough, if you think about something often enough, the electrical impulses in your brain are going to create a pathway where you have to think about that thing even when you don't want to think about it. Therefore, it's paramount that we learn how to guard our thoughts. In Proverbs, the fourth chapter, in verse 23, the wise man puts it this way. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Now, when Solomon said, keep your heart, he was not talking about that big organ behind your chest. He was not referring to that thing that is in our body about here. When Solomon says, keep your heart, what he is meaning and what he is saying is keep your mind. The New English Bible puts it this way, guard your heart or guard your mind more than any treasure, for it is the source of life. Again, in the Bible in particular, the Old Testament, the heart refers to the intellect. It refers to the emotions and thoughts. So in other words, if I were translating Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 loosely, this is how it would read. Guard your mind, watch what you think, 
Be conscious of the thoughts that pass through your brain because the thoughts that pass through the brain are going to cause a groove in the brain. They are going to create an electrical pathway in the brain. Those thoughts are going to develop attitudes. Those attitudes are going to lead to actions, and those actions are going to determine your eternal destination. Remember, if you think about something long enough, it's going to impact your attitudes and your actions. Let me repeat that again. As a man thinketh, so is he. Or for that matter, as a woman thinketh, so is she. This morning, we're going to look at several practical steps to guard our thoughts. Several eternal biblical principles so that we can follow the admonition of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, which states, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Principle number one, thoughts repeated become thoughts ingrained. Let me say that again. Thoughts repeated become thoughts ingrained. Now, what does the word ingrained mean? Well, it means firmly fixed. It means established. We become what we think. Further admonition comes from the Apostle Paul, who in Colossians, the third chapter, verses one and two, makes this statement. He says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Now, the two key words in this passage are seek in verse one and set in verse two. If you want to change your focus, seek heavenly things and then set your mind on those heavenly things. Sometimes when I'm watching TV, I will do what they call surface channel, channeling. I will hop, skip, and jump from one channel to another until I find what I'm looking for. Once I have done that, then I will lock in that channel or I will set that channel to where I want it so that I can watch that particular show. Now, what I'm saying is that when we compare this to a spiritual lesson, what the Bible teaches us is that change means when you pay attention to something and that something is not what God would have you to fix your mind on, then you cannot maintain a heavenly relationship with your heavenly father. Remember that thoughts repeated become thoughts ingrained. Ellen White puts it this way. In the book, Christian Education, page 65, she makes this statement. Listen to the first sentence especially carefully. She says, it is a law of the mind that gradually adapts itself upon the subject that is trained to dwell. Now I'm gonna repeat that again because this perhaps is the key thought of everything that we're talking about this morning. Christian Education, page 65, the servant of the Lord, pardon me, the servant of the Lord says, it is a law of the mind that gradually adapts itself upon the subject that is trained to dwell. If occupied, she continues, with common matters only, it will become dwarfed and enfeebled. If never required to grapple with difficult problems, it will after a time almost lose the power of growth. As an educating power, the Bible is without rival. In the word of God, the mind finds subjects for the deepest thought 
and the loftiest aspirations. And so, we are admonished again through inspiration that as we read the Word of God, it changes not only our character, it changes our mental ability so that we become much sharper, much clearer in our thinking. That's what the Bible will do for you when you study it. Ironically, or I should say incidentally, in this upcoming quarter, the whole lesson study for 13 weeks is dealing with the scriptures and interpreting the scriptures. How God works miraculously to give to us just what we need when we need it. So, principle number one, as I stated earlier, was this. Thoughts repeated become thoughts ingrained. Now, principle number two, in changing your thoughts. Don't accept every thought that passes through your mind as true. Merely because you think something doesn't make what you think a reality. Simply because we think negative thoughts about someone or even about ourselves, do not make those thoughts a fact. We are going to look at three passages in John as we consider thoughts about ourselves, thoughts about others, and thoughts about our circumstances. Now first, let's look at thoughts about ourselves. If you have your Bibles and you're streamlining and, and you're watching this service today, I would invite you to turn to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. Let me repeat before I read that text. Merely because you think negative thoughts about yourself does not necessarily make those thoughts true. Now, the text. This is what it says. By the way, this is a text that we often use uh, when we have communion in church. It says, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. We've already established that another word for heart is the mind. If our mind condemns us because of our struggle with sin, remember that where sin abound, grace did much more abound. When the devil tells you that you're going to go to hell because of those sins that condemn you, you tell the devil that you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who is faithful and just to forgive you all of your sins. When the devil tells you that you are too weak to overcome his power, you tell the devil, yes, you're correct, but let him know also that you have the right man on your side, the man of God's own choosing. Doth ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabbath, his name, and he has won the battle. Yes, I am weak, but he is strong. When the devil tells you that your family or your marriage is falling apart and there is no hope, you tell the devil that with Jesus in the family, happy, happy home. If Jesus can raise dead, or rather if Jesus can raise folk from the dead, then certainly he can resurrect a marriage that's on the rocks. Don't listen to Satan. Don't listen to his falsehoods about yourself because the Bible says in John chapter 8 and verse 44 that the devil was a liar from the beginning and he is still lying. As long as Christ is mediating in the most holy place on your behalf, you have 
every opportunity of being saved. Yes, even on this 28th day of March 2020, Jesus is still pleading to the Father on your behalf when you seek forgiveness for your sins. So don't listen to the lies of the devil. There is hope for all of us. Number two, often the devil plants negative thoughts in our minds about others. Merely because you think something about somebody doesn't mean that what you're thinking about that person is true. Our perceptions of others are often not realities. Here's the Bible basis for what I just said. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves, every, pardon me, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, Let's jump down to verse 11 of that same chapter. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The Bible says clearly that God is love. So notice, if someone puts negative thoughts in your mind about another person where you don't wish the best, for that individual, from where are those thoughts coming? Well, they certainly are not coming from above. We sometimes criticize other people unfairly. We don't know all of their circumstances. We don't know their motives. Only God, who is aware of all the facts, can judge righteously. The thoughts we have towards others are not always true. Now, often we have thoughts about life's circumstances. And here's how the devil tempts us in that area. He will suggest this to you. Life is unfair. Why did this have to happen to me? This is unfair. I don't deserve it. When thoughts like that permeate your mind, that God has treated you unfairly, or God has allowed you to be treated unfairly, it's easy to doubt his loving intentions towards you, or worse yet, to become angry with you. God is not angry with you. He loves you. Now, this leads us sometimes when we think that things, because they're not going our way, and we're struggling with this, we're having a hard time with that, that God is punishing us. Well, the truth of the matter is God never wants us to think negatively about ourselves as long as he is on the throne. Because we're told in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not made himself perfect in love. So, if indeed I am complaining about the circumstances of life and all the bad things that have happened to me, how unjust and how unfair life is, if my life is filled with fear and worry over those things, that's torment. There are many things in life that we do not fully understand, like Job, for example. But we know this one thing for certain, and that is when life seems out of control, our God is still in control. I do believe that when we get to heaven, and praise God, I'm looking forward to seeing each and every one of you in heaven. When we get there and we talk to our Savior and he talks to us, we will see 
that we would choose to be led no other way in this life than the way that Christ guided us. In Christ, life's circumstances don't overwhelm us. The coronavirus, COVID-19, shouldn't overwhelm us. Why? Because Jesus has cast out fear. And he's got the whole world in his hands. Next, if you want to change your thoughts, replace old thoughts with new ones. Romans 12 and verse 2 says this, and I repeat Romans 12 and verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you recall the story that Jesus told in the Bible about a man who was possessed with seven demons? And what happened when that house was empty? Seven more demons came back. What is Jesus saying in that story about his church today? Well, here's what he's saying. If you cast out an evil thought from your mind and you don't place it with a good thought, seven more evil thoughts are going to come flooding into your mind. Fill your mind with good thoughts and you will be able to drive out the evil thoughts. If good thoughts do not fill the empty spaces, evil thoughts will. All empty spaces are going to be filled with something. Therefore, scripture urges us to bring every thought into captivity to Jesus Christ. If you want a reference for that, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. From the book, My Life Today, page 272, we are told, when we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united, our heart is united with his heart. The will is merged with his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. Next, if you want the mind of Christ, analyze your thoughts. Ask, where is this thought coming from? Is Christ inspiring this thought or is it coming from the devil? Let's look at James chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. James chapter 3, 14 through 17. The Bible says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. The wisdom, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So, if I'm feeling bitter towards another person, if I'm feeling envious towards another person, immediately I should know that that's not the mind of Christ. Bitter envy, the apostle says, does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. The wisdom that is from above is what? Pure, James says, it's gentle, full of mercy, and good fruit. Analyze your thoughts. Who's the author of those thoughts? Be sure you're right, and then go ahead. Next, thoughts not only lead to actions, but actions lead to thoughts. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 3 states, Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be 
establish. What the wise man is saying here is that if you want to get a person to think a certain way, then get them to act a certain way. And the reverse is also true. If you want a person to act a certain way, then get them to think a certain way. There once was a study that was conducted using eight to 10 people in three different groups. And the purpose of this study was to get a concept of the individual's emotions. The ones who let out in this study said this to each group. They said, we're going to give you something to act out. And whether you feel that way or not, we want you to act this out as intensely and passionately as you can. So, the first group that they took, they said to that group, we want you to act out sadness. When you get into your room, tell every sad story that you can think about because we are going to measure your emotional response to sadness. To the second group, they said, we want you to act out anger, one to another. You may be the closest of friends, but when you get in that room, we want you to shout at one another. We want you to ball your fist, and we are going to measure your anger. We're going to do that in response to how your emotions really are. And to the third group, they said, we want you to act out happiness and joy. Now, believe it or not, brothers and sisters, here's what happened to each of the groups. The people who acted out sadness were sad for three weeks beyond the experiment. The people who acted out anger remained angry with one another for a long time and even friendships were broken. The people who acted out joy continued to be joyous. And what the research showed was this. If you want to change your thinking process, begin to change the way you act. By the way, that's one thing I love about God's church. It's because when I go to church on Sabbath morning, I have not during the coronavirus, of course, but prior to that, I had the joy of shaking hands and hugging my brothers and sisters. And those actions were reciprocated to me. That's what this is all about. That's what the Bible is all about. That's what changing your mind is all about. You act lovely towards someone, and what you reap is what you're going, or rather what you sow is what you're going to reap. If you hand out joy, joy is going to come back to you. So from a spiritual standpoint, get actively involved in the outreach of church programs like Ignite Indiana, and your thoughts will follow your actions. Finally, place a screen on your mind. Just like you use a screen door or a screen window to keep mosquitoes and other bugs from coming into your house, especially in the summer, God gives us a screen to keep evil thoughts from coming into our minds. You are very familiar with the text, and it was read by Brother Benji earlier today. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. It says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Breaking this text down just a little bit. First, whatsoever is true. The promises of God are true. 
you can take them to the bank. Fill your mind with those promises. There are over 3,000 of them in the scriptures. The next one, whatsoever is honest. Another translation for honest is honorable, meaning reverent or worthy of dignity, as opposed to that which is cheap and artificial. Fill your mind with that which is high and holy. Next, whatsoever is just. Justice has to do with righteousness in the Bible. Ask yourself this question when you're reading a particular book or looking at a particular TV program. Is this leading me to righteousness or right actions? Next, whatsoever is pure. Purity is something that is so clean that it is fit to be brought into the presence of God. So again, I have to ask myself, when I'm reading this book or looking at that program, can I bring this into the presence of God? Whatsoever is of good report. Whatever is that means that is it fit for God to hear? If it's not, if it's not false, ugly, cheap, or impure, then it should be okay for you and God to hear or to listen, whatever that is. And finally, if there is any virtue, virtue raises me higher so that I can be the best that God wants me to be. I love what Ellen White says in the book, Steps to Christ, page 47. She makes this statement, the power of choice God has given to men. It is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart, but you can choose to serve God. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Thus, your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Holy Spirit. Your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with his thoughts. And so, I invite you to do that with me right now. If it is your prayer and you want to say, I desire to give God my will so that my mind can be the mind of Christ and my thoughts are the thoughts of the Holy Spirit. If that is your prayer, and you want the mind of Christ to be in you, not just for today, but for always until you see him coming to the clouds of glory, then I would invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessings to us. We recognize that our enemy, the one we call Satan, the devil, the serpent, that he's doing everything to control our minds so that we will be slaves to him. But our prayer this day is that the mind of Christ will be in us. And so that we will say, not our will, but thy will be done. Bless us and keep us. And remember, Heavenly Father, our prayers as we're praying for the situation around the world regarding this pandemic. We know that you have all things in control in your hands because you know the end from the beginning. Help us not to fear, but help us to trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Is our prayer in his name. Amen. May God bless each and every one of you and have a good day in the Lord.